those magnificent gates were the gates of heaven. Perhaps not heaven in the classical sense, but after being transported for three days without any food at all, a slice of bread and a watery soup, which could be visualized behind the gates, came pretty close to an approximation of heaven. This name was apt in other ways as well. Here, new arrivals were presented by a little welcoming speech by the man in charge of the institution. He was very explicit. Here are the gates, he said. This is where you came in. Then he pointed out the three chimneys and explained, this is where all of you will leave. Unquestionably, a very honest man. Hello, my name is Tom. Tom Gedalia. I'm Jewish and I was born in Hungary. Lately I have found that memories I didn't even know I had suddenly appear from way, way down. They appear with great clarity and I find myself in a different land, a land where I used to live many years ago. Now that I have reached the age of distinguished antiquity, the time has come for me to put all those memories together and tell you about people I met, things I saw during those dark days. They will be with us even if only for a few minutes. This is a concentration camp. It is nearly in the same original condition as it was when liberated by the 37th U.S. Army. We will go inside and you will see how the daily life in this institution was conducted. There, I would also like to tell you a few short stories about the feelings, emotions, and history of gentle individuals, mostly young women and children whose life have touched mine during the war years. This way, you will understand not only the mechanics, but also how living in a concentration camp changed a person's mental approach to everyday life. But it's very interesting to note right at this point that once you're inside the camp, how greatly the psychology, the outlook, even the very acceptance of life changes. They make you a different person. It's hard to believe, but you completely change. Your expectations are reduced to one slice of a bread. And you can live with that. You could say, okay, I will die. You see people die right. You see people die left. You see people die very, very suddenly. And you see people you know will die in the next half an hour. And they know it too. Uh, we could live with that. That we could accept. There is one thing we couldn't accept. And that, I think, was the greatest tragedy to all of us living in this camp that when we die, nobody would know how did we die. Outside the prisoner's camp were the guards' barracks. Today they are replaced by memorials erected by countries whose citizens died here. This memorial is in remembrance of Hungarian Jews. This is for the Russian prisoner of wars and also a very impressive memento is a seven-branch candelabrum in the form of a monument donated by the State of Israel. This statue affected me more than anything else, than all the monuments together. I didn't know why, and then I thought about it and then came to me that, that reminded me of my friends, of my friend. A friend whose name was George. We were together in forced labor camp a long, long time before we got here. Now, George was an exceptional person. 
I, I cannot describe you what George was because I never saw anybody like George. To begin with, where everybody was unkind and worrying about his piece of bread, George didn't care. George helped everybody. Where people couldn't lift a stone, George went there and lifted up the stone for them. It was a very abnormal behavior pattern in a place like this or the place where we were. And I remember once we were walk walking down the road. It was raining. It was a miserable rainy day, gray, cold. And George had an even bigger nose than I do. I remember how the drops, the raindrops, fell down his nose. And then somebody came and hit him with a two-by-four. And I looked at George, and he was smiling. And I said, George, are you crazy? How can you smile? They're hitting you here, you're cold. The water is running down your face. And George said, I'm happy. And I said, how, how could anybody be happy here? And he said, I'm happy because I know what's happening is God's will. And anything that happens is God's will. And if that's what God wants to happen to me, I'm happy. Because his will is the most important thing for me. And one day, one morning, the sun was shining. George woke up and he said, Tom, everything is all right. And I said, George, <laughs> you know, here we are in the deepest mess. How could everything be all right? And he said, first time in my life, first time, God came to me. And God said that everything will be all right. After the war, after the war my two children, my wife, and I will be all together again, and we will be very happy. And I didn't want to say anything. What, what, what can you tell a person at that point? Not, not much. Two days later, they were asked, all of us were asked, who is sick, who is unhealthy, who, who, who cannot work, and would we step up and they will take us to a hospital? And I wasn't well, I didn't step out, but George was in a very, very bad shape. He was very thin, very tall. He stepped out. They took him away, not too far, because we could hear the shots. And he was shot. And of course, George gave me his address and the wife's name, children's name. I went back. I went back. And they told me that just about the same time when God spoke to George, they took them away. They came in a truck, they put all the Jews in it, and they took them away. Today and then, they are together. George, his wife, and the two little girls. The reason the concentration camp was built on this particular spot was because of the proximity of this quarry. And also the obvious economic benefits gained by using slave labor. Those 186 steps, very steep, rudimentary steps, connected the camp with the quarry. There were always a sufficient numbers of new workers Large transport of new prisoners arrived frequently, and the problem of overcrowding, which could have created an epidemic, was solved in the most inexpensive manner. People were eliminated by a combination of starvation diet and exhaustion from working in the quarry. Here, prisoners, neatly lined up in rows of five, were forced to carry large granite blocks strapped to their backs up those stairs. This sign explains in detail how the guards, bored with their repetitious job of pressing the inmates for greater speed, amused themselves by pushing a man backward just as he reached the top of the very step grade. He fell back with a stone still attached to his back, 
And he took the long line of people following behind with him to the bottom of the quarry, producing a mass of bodies and rocks at the base of the steps, with arms, legs, and head sticking out, all covered with blood. This game was laughingly referred to by the guards as an avalanche and was practiced frequently. Another source of hilarity for those in charge was to take the last ten rows of prisoners, that is, fifty men who, being the last to reach the top, were considered and probably were too weak for heavy labor. They were lined up at the upper edge of this wall and forced to jump. The prisoner who died that way were referred to as the parachutists. All ended up at the bottom of the quarry. Most were dead, but some, who landed on top of others, had only broken bones. At the end of the day, Instead of stones, the last detail carried the dead and the dying up to the camp where they were cremated the same day. Between the buildings was a roll call area. Here prisoners were counted three times a day, often in freezing temperatures or under the burning sun. The starving, ill-dressed prisoners had to stand at attention for hours. Public execution also took place here in front of the assembled prisoners. This building, like most facing the local area, was used for administrative purposes. It was quite famous because beside keeping individual records of all prisoners, it also housed the bordello. I would like to tell you a story which happened a long time ago, during the war. I was in the forced labor camp. They dragged us all, or, all around Europe. And this was in the middle of a forest. It was just early spring. The sun came through the street, through the trees. It was beautiful. I was alone, and to my surprise, I found a very large hole in the ground, covered with leaves and all sorts of things. And I looked inside, there was nothing there. The only thing I found, in a little pocket, a letter. A letter written by a woman, sent to her husband, which was very touching. I carried around with me for years. And that letter, I think, is part of history what people went through, and I like to read it to you. It is a letter written by a wife who is at home to her husband. My dearest husband, I hope, I hope my, letter my letter finds, finds you in good health. We are well. Tonight is Friday. I lit the Sabbath candles. We always put the candles on the dresser. Kathy is a big girl now, and she always insists on standing on a chair in front of it. We attached your picture to the mirror, and when she stands on the chair, we can see the three of us together, even if only for a short time. My beloved husband, the news is not good. Last week, all Jews were taken away in large trucks from the next street for resettlement somewhere in a small village. The truck stopped coming this afternoon. We were told that they were taking the weekend off, but that we should be ready on Monday morning and should pack food for two days and carry one change of clothing. That means we have two days left. This is a very hard letter to write. I have to say goodbye, and I also must ask for your forgiveness. Please, far away as you are, and strange as it may sound, try very hard to understand me. Today I found out that the story about our resettlement is not true. There is proof 
that the women have been separated from the men and taken to an indescribably bad place where they are tortured and killed because they are Jewish? There is a great deal of pain and suffering every day before they die, and every day is the same. I have made absolutely sure that this is so and not just a rumor. I spoke to Dr. Groats today, and he also confirmed that the news is true and the danger is real. He gave everyone pills who asked for them. Very strong, strong pills. They put you to sleep forever. My dear husband, I am absolutely certain that you don't want Kathy and me used in ways which I don't want to describe to you. I must ask for your forgiveness for what I am going to do. Tonight, after the candles have burned down, I will mail this letter. Later, before we go to bed, I will make Kathy a hot drink and mix the pills into it. I won't tell her anything. After I am sure that she will never wake up again, I will also take the pills. Please forgive me if I ever did anything to hurt you in the past. If I did, it was not intentional. Please understand and forgive me. There is no way out. Goodbye. Your loving wife. The House of Death A total of 122,776 registered men and women were killed in this camp. All of them ended up in this building. 122,776 is just a number. But perhaps it's easier to understand this figure if you try to imagine that at your place of work one person would be killed every 60 seconds during a normal working day. And it would be also decided to keep this up for a full year. If that would happen, the total number of victims should be still less than 122,776. The jail, with its 34 cells, was used for extracting information from the so-called prominent prisoners. Interrogation took place in here. This is the only cell with tiles on the wall and a drain in the floor. The prominence included American, Canadian, British and Russian prisoners of war, well-known people in politics carefully registered on their fictitious names, and also individuals suspected of having considerable wealth. None of them stayed very long. Of the approximately 4,600 individuals who were questioned in this jail, only 400 left alive. And that is one out of every 10 person. This building was also used for many other purposes. If prisoners were not shot by the guard in this camp or killed in the quarry, the last thing they saw before they died were these instruments of death. It could have been this room where others already hanged were swinging from this beam, or did they see the physician in his white coat taking time off from his medical experiments to administer lethal injections of gasoline directly into the prisoner's heart. The dead all ended up in the crematorium. This is one of the three similar installations. All were operating 24 hours a day, every day, and still couldn't keep up with the demand. Before cremated, the cadavers were laid on this di dissecting table where all gold dental work 
was removed with a hammer. There was one more way to die in this building. It was the most cruel, heartless invention of the system to murder people. For larger groups, they use a gas chamber. It took 20 minutes for a person to die. 20 minutes of indescribable horror, pain, and agony. There was a mental suffering, the knowledge that once the doors are locked and they hear the hissing of the gas, there was no way out from here. Also the sudden understanding by the individual that the air is contaminated, and when the gas reaches the ceiling, they will also turn blue, like the old people who have already collapsed and are lying here, dying. There was also the physical pain as the searing gas slowly ate away the inside of their lungs. The person most dear to me died in a gas chamber. Her crime, she was born to Jewish parents. She had two children. They were both with her. A little boy and a little girl. The rule was very strict. Children and women with children were immediately sent to the gas chamber when they arrived. Sometimes I dream that I'm with them during those 20 minutes. I dream that I'm sitting on the floor holding her hand and try to pull her down next to me. She puts her hand away so she can lift the children high, close to the ceiling where there is still some fresh air left. Not much, but enough for a few more gulps. As the mothers with children stand, you can see young children and babies floating above the crowd, like Botticelli's little angels. I tell her about the gas, how heavy it is, how it will settle on the floor first, and then it will take a long time to reach the ceiling in a concentration strong enough to kill. Twenty minutes. I ask her to help the children die. Make them lie on the floor. Put them between the two of us so they won't see the two old people nearby choking, trembling, dying. Hold the children tight, very tight. Don't let them stand up. Look at them and tell them that everything will be all right. She puts her arm around the children and speaks softly. We will be out of here soon. But first, both of you have to take a deep, deep breath. I know it hurts, but let's do it once more. All of us together, like this, at the same time. That was very good. Now put your head on, mommy. We will be out of here soon. It won't be long now. I sit on the floor looking down at the three of them and cry. <laughs>